Welcome back to the Lars Larson Show. Pleasure to be with you and always glad to get your calls. You're live on the Radio Northwest Network, and it is First Amendment Friday. If you want to call into the show, it's 866-HEY-LARS. That's 866-439-5277. Emails go to talk at LarsLarson.com. And just a little while ago, a gentleman called me as a naysayer, and he said, Lars, you need to tie all this together and tell everybody this is part of a long-running plot to take over America. And by this, he means the riots, the looting, the protests, the identity politics and everything else. It's created an ugly scene in America, and it has the mob in the streets demanding that they be listened to and that the rest of us be ignored effectively, which I don't think makes any sense. But there is some truth to what the man told me, that uh, laws passed half a century ago primed the conditions that have created today's ugly identity politics. And on the phone with me right now is Mike Gonzalez, who's a senior fellow at the Heritage Foundation. Mike, welcome back. And Lars, it's so great to be on with you. So your caller used the word plot? He used the uh, plot. He, he said, look, this is part of Das Kapital. It's part of communism. It's part of uh, Saul Alinsky. And I said, well, we reference all of those. But I also told him, if I tie all of it together and say it's all part of a master plan, some of it is, I imagine. And some of the people in the streets are just being pushed around by activists who say, let's go down and protest this or protest that. They come up with some slogans like ACAB, all cops are bastards, and then they're off to the races. And I think some of the people who show up may not be politically inclined at all. They just like going down and smashing things and burning things and feeling as though they have some kind of outlet for their frustration, whatever their frustration is. Is there, some, is there truth to both sides of that? Uh, no, absolutely. I was interested in that he used the word plot, because as you well know, that's in the, in the title of my book, The Plot to Change America. Yep. Uh, you know, I do believe, and by the way, what you just said just now before, it's absolutely true. There are some people, there are some people who, who want to march because they were outraged by the manner in which uh, uh, George Floyd was killed. And, you know, I have members of my family who feel outraged by this, but that is not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is this uh, attempt to change America, to transform America. And, and the hard left has been very open about this for a very long time. And you're right. Uh, I have a piece today in the Wall Street Journal in which I said, uh, I, 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 I say to our leaders, uh, not just our political leaders, but our corporate leaders and our media leaders, that the last time we had large-scale race riots in the United States in the 1960s and 70s, uh, ideologues and activists uh, intimidated bureaucrats into passing really bad really bad rules and we, we're still living with the consequences of that. I believe that identity politics, <clears throat> the, the foundations of it were created back then uh, and I say that in my book The Plot to Change America. I explained that, I explained that in my book, I explained it in a, in a short version today in the Wall Street Journal so absolutely yes, we, yeah, we can talk about that because that is I, I think what is happening I mean, because when people talk about transforming something, my wife and I usually buy old houses and we try to transform them into a nice house that doesn't look old and decrepit anymore. We managed to do that. On the other hand, there are things like Hurricane Katrina that, that transformed New Orleans, but not in a good way. So when people talk about transformation, I guess uh, it depends on what kind of transformation you're talking about, destructive transformation or constructive transformation. Talk about the specific laws in the 1960s. And are we talking most about the Great Society? Yeah, well, there, there is the Great Society. All these, a lot of these laws were well intended, uh, but actually it replaced the, the, the breadwinner in the house, and, 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 and we had, as a result, the breakup of the family, and we have a very high national, national out-of-wedlock rate right now, and a lot of families have single parents. But I, the, 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 the policy that I talked about was the, actually the creation of racial categories, of ethnic categories, uh, not, not in races that are based in biology or anything that is real, but ra- ethnic categories that were created by OMB and other government uh, uh, bureaus, uh, it cobbled out of very many different people. And two of those in mind, obviously, are Hispanics and Asians. Uh, created by Rule Number 15 uh, in, in 1977 by the Office of Management and Budget, and then you had the creation as well of the racial preferences of identity politics. Sorry, of, of affirmative action, and in, in these racial preferences of affirmative action, it kind of incentivized people to adhere to these groups, right? But but that also creates 
a third thing, a third part of the equation, which is a, a grievance-fueled culture of victimhood. And, and, and because you have to say, I am a member of Group B. Group B has been, has been a victim of, of, of awful discrimination. I am owed cons- compensatory justice. Yep. That is the that is the bricks and mortars of identity politics today. And when that happens, just let me finish out on this. When you create a culture of victimhood, when people draw their pride and their claim on on, on justice on their victimhood, they have a zero incentive not to no longer become a victim, to, to surmount their obstacles and their problems. Victimhood gets put on a hamster wheel that never stops. Well, and in fact, there used to be a pride. I mean, I remember when I was in high school, somebody say, oh, so-and-so was on welfare. And we said, oh, that's too bad. I hope he gets off of it very quickly, you know, because nobody wanted to be on it. Today, if you said, well, I, I, I benefit from set-asides, racial set-asides, gender set-asides. There are contracts set aside for my company that are based on my skin color, based on my gender, these days based on your sexuality. Um, and, and that all of that says, as long as I'm a victim, I get those things. The minute I say, I'm not a victim. I can compete with everybody else, which I think everybody is perfectly capable of in this society, then all of a sudden you don't get those things anymore and the politicians lose out because they want you to be captive to that victimhood. Because then they can say, if you want the good stuff to continue coming because of your victimhood, you need to vote for me and not that guy. Yeah, you know, absolutely right about that. There's two uh, two writers out there, uh, two social uh, science writers, Manning and Campbell, who have written about this, <clears throat> and they, they say exactly what you just said. They call the present age a, a culture of victimhood, and they say prior to that, your claim to attention, your claim uh, to, 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 to saying who you were, your, to, your claim to pride, was having overcome the challenges that life will always and inevitably throw our way. We, we, we always, we, we have, life can be a struggle for all of us. The overcoming that struggle is what gets you to the promised land, and you say, and then you can say to people, "I overcame that challenge. I overcame that struggle, and, and that is why I am standing here tall." That is less and less the case because, as you say, we reward feelings of grievances. So, Mike, is there a way to get back to that? Because like you, I don't know about you, but when I was I was working my way through the year and a half of college I did, I worked some crap jobs. But I worked them, and I was glad to say, yeah, I had to work these crappy jobs, but it paid the bills while I was doing this and getting to here. And it, and it allowed me to look back and say, yeah, I came a long way, and those were some lousy jobs, but I was glad I worked at them. Uh, and, Lars, just like, just like you, I paid my way through college. My parents were immigrants. My mom didn't have any money. My, my dad had died. I had, to, I had a job at a Burger King that I started at midnight, and I, worked, I cleaned out that Burger King. I stopped at 7 a.m. every night. Oh, my God. That's the job I had in college. You had the grease trap job. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and, 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 and I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud of of having overcome this and paid for college and gotten loans and paid for my loans. Uh, So, so, so you're, I, and there is a way to get to that. I think we need our leaders to understand what has taken place and be, and they have to be, they have to be courageous to speak out about this. I think you're right, Mike. And wouldn't it be nice? I mean, I've never heard somebody say, well, I proved to the college I wanted to go to that I was a victim, and so they just gave me free tuition. Uh, I, I, I have heard people <laughs> complain, not complain, but to brag about the, the lousy jobs they worked to make sure they could pay that next tuition bill. You should read the piece by Mike Gonzalez in the Wall Street Journal and his new book called The Plot to Change America. Mike is a senior fellow at the Heritage Foundation, and he's always welcome on this program. Mike, thank you very much. We'll be back in just a moment. Glad to have you with me on a First Amendment Friday. And coming up, should the city of Seattle be holding segregated training sessions for white staff aimed at undoing their whiteness? You've got the Lars Larson Show.